Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's just Olivia and I this week for Wednesdays in the Word, kind of taking a throwback here to uh, the way we used to do things. Carolyn had something come up and wasn't able to join us. And I think Caden has had something come up as well. Uh, he's getting busy and uh, ready, I think, to head back to school in a couple of weeks. So it's kind of a crazy busy time. But Olivia and I are happy to have you join us. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 23 this week. And this is Paul's um, trial before the Sanhedrin. And um, I'm kind of breaking it up like this. Um, it, you'll kind of see now in the next uh, few weeks. Oh, and I should make a note also next week we'll not be doing um, a study because I'll be uh, traveling uh, with my dad, spending some time with my dad next week. And so we will not have a Bible study next week. Um, but so this week we'll have the religious trial next week. Then chapter 24 is the trial before uh, Felix, who is the, um, kind of the governor of Judea. And then um, the week after that, chapter 25, the trial before uh, Festus. And um, that'll probably move also into chapter 26. So we'll break up those trial segments. Um, but this week we're on the um, kind of religious trial here before the Sanhedrin in chapter 23 and it actually starts at the very end of chapter 22 if you remember from last week we kind of left off uh at the end a couple of um well yeah let's just talk about a couple of uh kind of definitions and terms and everything before we start reading it makes more sense i think for you to kind of know these things there's particularly three terms that we're pretty familiar with um, if you're familiar with reading the gospels but i think um, we need just kind of some definitions and explanations here the first is the sanhedrin so paul will be brought before the sanhedrin what is the sanhedrin we hear that mentioned um, quite a few times in the gospels the sanhedrin was a kind of a a religious tribunal it was made up of elders, Jewish elders, wise rabbis, kind of leaders in the religious um, community. They were kind of like the Supreme Court for religious law. There were kind of two different types of Sanhedrin. There was what they called the lesser Sanhedrin that was made up of 23 of these um, rabbis or elders. Uh, but then there was the great Sanhedrin, which was made up of 71 uh, of those individuals. The great Sanhedrin is the one that met each day in the temple and they would discuss uh, and hear cases on religious law. They would discuss uh, different things as far as, as religious law, the, according to the law of Moses, those kinds of things were concerned. Um, that particular Sanhedrin, the greater Sanhedrin, was headed by the high priest of the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, so then there was, um, we'll hear about Pharisees and Sadducees. We've heard those terms as well in the gospel. And I think it's um, good to kind of understand the difference between these two parties. The Pharisees was the party of laymen and scribes. They uh, were more uh, religiously liberal, I guess. They would um, they um, relied on the law of Moses contained in the first five books of the Old Testament, for us, the Old Testament, um, the Torah, the Jewish Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, but then they also used um, different kinds of teachings and writings of um, very wise uh, rabbis and scholars. It was, uh, they, and those were put together into a collection of writings, kind of wisdom called the Mishnah. And that's still used uh, to this day. So they would use both the Torah and kind of human wisdom or human reason um, and 
um, revelation to interpret and apply uh, the religious laws. Um, the Pharisees also were the group of people who were responsible for the establishment of synagogues, which it would have been kind of a local house of worship where um, you wouldn't necessarily offer sacrifices because sacrifices could only be at the temple. But these synagogues were places that people in you know, the far outer regions uh, and in, in other countries, especially after the Jews were scattered, uh, could meet and study Torah, hear, hear the reading of, of uh, the word and, and those kinds of things, kind of like our modern day um, church. Um, the Pharisees also believed in the resurrection of the dead. That's kind of important than when we compare to the Sadducees. So the Sadducees was a party of high priests, um, aristocratic families, uh, wealthy merchants, um, wealthy uh, individuals. They were um, only relying, only used the Torah, the five books of Moses, as far as applying the law. All the other things they said that God's word is the final word. That's the only word that we're going to accept and use. They were also heavenly, heavily influenced by the Hellenists, which were kind of a Greek um, influence on them. They were much more conservative and they believed in um, no resurrection from the dead. So kind of two uh, big differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. First, regarding the resurrection of the dead, Pharisees say yes, Sadducees say no. And then also, as far as uh, what do you use uh, to, to rule as far as law? Uh, and the Sadducees were much more conservative in that um, and literal. So for instance, when, they, um, when the Old Testament speaks of an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, they would take that literally. If, uh, uh, I mean, if if you hurt somebody and maybe like um, broke their arm or caused them an injury to an arm, then your punishment would be that you would have a similar injury caused to your arm, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and then of course, Pharisees, um, resurrection, um, more liberal, more willing uh, to consider other things as far as divine revelation in interpreting the law and the wisdom of um, like the prophets and um, those kinds of things. So that's kind of how it's set up here. Now, let's go ahead and start reading. I'll start um, and I'm gonna read in, um, I'm going to start at the end of chapter 22 in verse 30, and then I'll read through 23 to verse, through verse 11. All right, here we go. The next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Now you remember, it's just a quick reminder from last week. The reason Paul was arrested was because some of the Jewish people accused him of bringing Gentiles into the inner courts of the temple, which was not true. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin. This is the uh, religious Supreme Court and said, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, you dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest. For it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. 
I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from there by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. All right, lots going on here <laughs> at the beginning. And it starts off with a bang. First of all, we're introduced to Ananias and we've heard about him before. He was um, the high priest um, at, at that time. Caiaphas was the high priest during the time that Jesus was condemned and sentenced to death. Ananias was now the high priest. And so um, Paul immediately, when he comes before the Sanhedrin, kind of makes a, a actually a very nice statement. He, he calls them brothers, my brothers. And then he says, I have filled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. And essentially he's like, look, I haven't done anything wrong. You need to understand that. Um, but then we're told that the high priest Ananias then orders those who are standing near Paul to hit him in the mouth. Why is this important? Well, a couple of things that we need to know and understand about Ananias. Ananias um, is described by Josephus, who was a Roman historian. He's in his writings. He um, kind of had a um, like a neutral um, observer kind of history. Um, he described Ananias as um, profane, greedy, and hot-tempered. Uh, Ananias did not have a good reputation as a high priest. Um, and what happened here is that he violated Jewish law by um, assuming that Paul was guilty before Paul's trial. And so then he orders um, this punishment that Paul be struck in the mouth. And Paul knows this and recognizes this. Paul knows what the Jewish law is because he was a Pharisee and he's, he's a good Jewish person. And so he responds by saying, wait a minute, um, you're standing there judging me about the law and yet you violated the law yourself because you've, you've punished me, you've harmed me um, without even giving me a fair trial first. That was in, in the law, Paul is right here. Um, and um, then Anna and I, then some of the guys standing by are like, how dare you talk to the high priest that way? And Paul makes this really interesting statement. Um, he says, oh, I didn't know he was the high priest. Um, because, uh, you know, it's, it's written that you should not um, speak badly about the ruler of your people. What does Paul mean like by that? Well, Paul is actually almost kind of like calling him out. And he's like, look, if you were really the ruler of our people and the high priest, you would not be behaving in this way. In other words, um, how are you representing the Jewish law? Uh, and so Paul is saying, I didn't know you were the high priest because you're not acting in a way that the high priest should act. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, just as a kind of interesting side note here, when I was doing research on Ananias, I found out that he was, um, he only got away with these kind of little like shenanigans uh, for a short time. He was, he was kind of a pro-Roman uh, person and um, the Jewish people eventually, you know, that just kind of catches up with him because he's so greedy and, and corrupt and everything. And he was assassinated then by the Jews 
in um, the year 66 AD, which is actually before uh, the temple was destroyed in the year 70. Um, so anyway, um, essentially what Paul is doing is, is saying here, you're a hypocrite um, and uh, you're behaving in a manner that would not lead me to think that you are the ruler of my people. And um, so then that kind of begs the question for us uh, as we study this, how do we represent Christ? Uh, when people see us and we proclaim to be Christians, um, do our actions testify or support our words? In other words, um, do we walk the walk and not just talk the talk? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we all mess up, right? But I mean, I think I've met like three people who actually like embody who Jesus was, um, which is kind of sad. <laughs> well, there are people that you just know are are followers of Jesus Christ, right? Because, oh yeah, yeah. I know who follow him. I it's just unfortunately a lot of the people I know use like certain parts to their gain kind of to fit their ideas they're not as open-minded like they couldn't I very rarely am able to have a discussion that doesn't end up with them like getting mad at me and, like yelling at me and being like you're wrong you know yeah, yeah. just not a civil discussion which I just don't think is how we should act right Right. But it I had to read that like section probably like three times because after I was like, why would you mouth off essentially? And then I was like, what's happening? What is happening? <laughs> well, that's what's happening is Paul's really kind of calling him out on it. And he's like, look, you're not you're not acting the way you're supposed to. But you read it and it's just kind of chaotic a little bit because unless you knew the only thing I was able to more so comprehend and understand when I read the commentary because one I don't know much about Jewish law so I was like oh it's illegal for <laughs> to be hit in the mouth right Two, I I just don't I didn't understand it seemed like Paul's like humanity got the best of him when he was kind of, I call it mouthing off but he was calling him a hypocrite but I just didn't get that I didn't fully understand that yeah well and it is a little bit of that too I think Paul's humanity does kind of um, come out a little bit here um, but yeah I think the other piece of it is and Paul's very knowledgeable um, with Jewish law and so really what's happening is is Paul is calling him out here it was not right for Ananias to order Paul to be punished before his trial was completed. He had Paul, he hadn't, had not even been tried yet. I mean, it was just Paul comes in and makes one statement and Ananias orders uh, that he be punished. And that's, that's not right, according to the Jewish law. So Paul calls him out on it. Yeah, once you said that it made more sense, because literally my next note, and I was like, wow, it's quick thinking on uh, Paul's part to kind of like start an argument to kind of take off the tension off of him for essentially like calling out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he does that. But then, yeah, you raise a really good point then, Olivia, because as we move further into the chapter, that's exactly what Paul's does. Paul does. He moves the debate then away from himself and um, starts um, kind of um, pointing out this controversy about the resurrection. Uh, he knows that. Part of it is that Paul's taking the focus off of himself. He knows this is gonna cause a problem because he knows there's both Pharisees and Sadducees. Paul himself is a Pharisee and he supports and believes in the resurrection from the dead. Um, Paul adds a different layer to that because his hope now and belief in the resurrection on the dead is because of Christ. Yeah. Um, for these other Pharisees, it's just their belief was that there would one day be a resurrection from the dead and judgment um, by God. Um, Paul understands that that resurrection from the dead and judgment then will involve 
salvation through what Jesus Christ has done for us, that the judgment against us is satisfied because of what Christ did. So it's almost like he's opening up here um, a point of conversation and an opportunity to lead into more of the gospel, but he's also diverting the discussion here um, and an argument happens. And it's a huge argument that happens over resurrection and over um, angels and stuff speaking to human beings, which is why you kind of see the Pharisees will wait. You know, they say, wait, what a minute. What if an angel has told him this stuff? Well, of course, the Sadducees don't believe in that kind of divine revelation. So that takes the argument even further. So they get into such a big fight that then the Roman commander comes in and once again takes Paul away from there because remember Paul is a Roman citizen and he has appealed to Rome and so the commander is responsible for this Roman citizen and so he takes him into kind of productive custody so to speak and then yeah. that that passage kind of ends like with kind of an encouraging thing then Jesus comes to him and says you know take courage buck up don't worry it's it's um, I'm going to be with you and I'm, I'm also going to make sure that you are going to have an opportunity to testify to the gospel in Rome. So it's, it's an encouraging kind of a note there too. It's just kind of funny because literally like for him to have to be in Paul's presence, be like, come on, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it? I just forget sometimes that, you know, Jesus like had humanity in him too. And so he, he's like, come on, like, it's just so funny to me that also it's just kind of disappointing that essentially with the Sanhedrin, there was no, like, not that anybody wins, but there was no winning there because they just didn't know how to get along or even talk in a civil conversation because it's totally fair for the Pharisees to be like what if an angel told him and just for that to turn into a whole big argument to the to the point where like the Roman soldiers are like okay like yeah. that well and remember the whole controversy here and the whole reason he's standing trial is based on a lie um, it's based on the fact that there are some Jews who were not happy about um, the Christian gospel that Paul was preaching, who make this thing up about Paul bringing Greeks uh, into the inner courts of the temple. And that was a lie. So really, the whole trial thing is, is a sham anyway. Yeah, I just don't know if it's because of who Ananias was. But I feel like if Ananias was considering himself a Sadducee at that point, he should have been like, okay, fair point. You guys can consider the possibility of an angel told him whatever, blah, blah, blah. We need more physical proof for our point of view. And so that kind of, kind of disappointing that like there's no, it's kind of a lose-lose situation either way for Paul. Right. right. And Ananias, yes, would have been from more than likely from the party of the Sadducees. Okay. so no resurrection no angels all right will you pick up and start reading in verse 12 and then will you go down um actually just finish the chapter okay okay the next morning the jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed paul more than 40 men were involved in this plot they went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Can I just stop there? I'm just that, no matter how many times I read this, that confused me. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. And it's perfectly okay to stop. Let's just kind of stop and talk here. So what happens is there are um, a group of Jews who are more than likely not part of the Sanhedrin. Um, and they have decided, and they're probably part of the Jews that reported Paul with this big lie in the first place. Um, and, and I don't mean this to be derogatory um, towards um, people of the Jewish faith. Don't, don't hear me in that. Um, 
they're people who are in opposition to the gospel of Christ. Um, so they think that Paul needs to be out of there and they want to kill him. And so they, they make this kind of pact You've heard of people making like suicide pacts and, and stuff like that. So they make this pact. There's about 40 of them. And they agree that they're not going to eat or drink anything until Paul is killed. And that's that means it's serious. So they want to get this task accomplished and they want to get done quickly because they all want to eat something and drink something. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah but they also want permission to go ahead and do this because they didn't want to wait for the Sanhedrin essentially. So they were impatient. I just didn't understand why you would take that kind of oath because there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to, I mean, like God is there. <laughs> so there's no guarantee you're going to be able to kill him. And also why not just like, eat? why not eat or drink? Your judgment becomes way more clouded. You're sluggish. Like you don't, you just don't have the capacity or the capability right. to get the strength to kill someone. It just doesn't seem effective. Yeah. So the, the, um, the practice of fasting, which is what this is, that was a pretty common thing when you're going to take like some sort of a solemn vow. Um, so this is kind of like a religious solemn fast that they're taking. Um, and oh. remember, yeah. And remember that these people don't believe that, that, um, uh, Paul has God's protection. They believe that Paul is preaching against God. This is totally new to them. And they see this as, as heresy. It's blasphemy, what Paul is oh. preaching and everything. So that's their motivation. And they are hell bent um, on making sure that, that he's dead. And so their plan more than likely is to figure out a way to kill him, you know, either when he's being transferred or um, when he's in, in the Roman barracks, which will become evident as you continue kind of reading. Okay. Yeah. Oh, makes more sense. I wish they would just say fasting sometimes. Cause yeah, I know. Be, yeah. I don't know. I'm just not familiar with solemn oaths. All right. Continuing verse 15. Now then you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. Yes, yeah, see, they want to kill him on the way. Yeah. They, I don't know, figure... tell, tell the Roman guys to bring him back here and we'll make sure that we get him taken care of before he gets back here is essentially what's going on. This next verse, like know your audience <laughs> yeah yeah verse 16 says but when the son of paul's sister heard of this plot he went into the barracks and told paul hello <laughs> well, it says it's paul's nephew who overhears which by the way is the only biblical reference that we have that he that paul even had a family so wow paul has a sister and she has a son and he happens to be there and overhears this so we don't know how old he is yeah. yeah, we have. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside, and asked, What is it that you want to tell me? He said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Okay, let's stop there for a second and just kind of talk a little bit now about this section. So here we have this young man, he's called a young man. So we could assume that he's probably maybe a teen. Um, and uh, he has this information and, and it's interesting that the commander takes him seriously. He believes him um, that they're, they've got this plot that they're, um, that they're going to kill Paul. I just wanna note here 
when we look, when we consider this plot that they have, that they kind of hatch in verses 14 and 15, um, notice how low they have sunk. Remember, um, there are a couple of laws here that prohibit them from doing what they're doing. First of all, Paul has not been granted a trial yet. So no punishment is legal. Secondly, and more importantly, God's commandments are, you shall not kill. And they are planning to kill a man who they don't know is for certain is guilty or innocent. Regardless, I mean, they have no basis to kill him other than they want to murder him. This, like <laughs> yeah. So this is, is, I find some, some kind of similarities here to um, not only our current culture, but I think this is a problem that we as human beings kind of wrestle with and have wrestled with throughout time where your um, position, um, you know, your social position, your prestige, your politics, your um, all those kinds of things become more important than what God has told us is appropriate behavior. They're willing to abandon all of that in order because their hatred has so consumed consumes them. I think they're a little bit spoiled too. I feel like I see more people who one are immature and two just just really spoiled, like just. Yeah, like I would never like be able to mouth off to you and dad and be like, and it would be like, give me a car. Like that would never fly. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's like, do you want to live? <laughs> like, I would never, ever do something like that. And I don't even know if this is that so much, Olivia, is that you were raised with the values of respect. Um not only for adults, I mean, certainly as a child, you were taught to respect adults, but even as an adult, you respect other human beings. Yeah, I think that's a, to I me, mean, that's always been important to me. Like yeah. I just yeah, always other human beings and stuff, but I, I think them just like wanting to kill him just because they don't like him I think I certainly can think of people who act that way, not in the murder sense, but they want what they want just because they want it. Right. But that, and certainly you know. look at people. I mean, it, 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 when we talk about killing people, it's not just even literally killing people. We're talking about sometimes, you know, character assassination. assassination. When yeah. we get mad at somebody because of what, for whatever reason, because they don't agree with us or because they've done something that we take personal offense to or whatever like the, um, that there is, we, we try to assassinate their character then also. I mean, there is more than one way to commit murder um, and, and you don't even have to physically touch anybody to harm them. That's why the commandment to not kill is so critically important because it's all wrapped yeah. up in, in making sure that you don't harm other people physically or in any other way. I think that's been lost a little bit. And because the core should be from what I think about it from coming from what Christ has taught us is just be kind to everyone and people are different like there's literally no one the same not even twins who are who come from the same egg are the same person yeah. they're they're different in some way and to for me to god characteristics are important who a person is is important yeah now do you take responsibility and do you take care of yourself and are you respectful and all these things that you should be taught especially I think in from a religious aspect I, I don't think that that's taught accurately anymore um and I it's just kind of sad because you know 
Yeah, I think it's taught. I think it's just, um, it's hard. It's hard to do this all the time. You know, Paul tells us that we are in, we are ambassadors for Christ, which means we represent him wherever we go. Do we always do a good job at that? Absolutely not, because we are flawed human beings. I mean, I, I try to represent Christ well everywhere that I go, um, but do I slip up and um, not represent Christ well? Do I um, not represent him at all at times? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it just happens. It happens. And he knows which is just kind of it's nice to know that he knows that too so it's yeah. never you never like mess up for forever like it's done and it's over yeah. with yeah um yeah so but because even paul like he not that he messed up in, in this way but he <laughs> like using his humanity for like quick thinking of like wait what about, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah look at this thing over yeah. here <laughs> squirrel <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah Resurrection. <laughs> okay. All right. Keep going here. 23 to the end of the chapter. Do you want me to read or are you okay reading? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm okay. good. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Is it Caesarea or Caesarea? Caesarea. Caesarea? Okay. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as in, in, Antipatris, I think. The next day, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Okay, so the commander here kind of outfoxes these, um, uh, this group of people who have developed this assassination plot, and he gets Paul out of there then and sends him to um, Governor Felix in Caesarea. So now he's moved from Jerusalem to Caesarea, and he's moved. It's, a, it's kind of amazing because he um, has 200 soldiers guarding Paul. Um, in addition to 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. I mean, this is, this is heavy duty, heavy duty guards here. Um, Do you have any records of why it was that much? Cause I, that just seems like a lot yeah, for him being to go unnoticed, like through. Right? Well, and they didn't go unnoticed. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the thing that's interesting is because this is not unnoticed. So this commander is sending a very clear message to the Sanhedrin and stuff. They're like, look, we're not, I know what you were planning to do and we're not tolerating that. And so now um, you all, instead of being able to handle it nicely in your own um, Supreme Court, in, the own, in your own Sanhedrin, because this is clearly a case of religious law, instead of being able to do that, now you're gonna have to go and do this before the Roman governor. This is a huge deal because it's now what's happening is they are taking the case of the religious law out of the hands of the Sanhedrin. That's whose hands it should have been in. Um, but they're taking it away from them because they're like, look, you messed up. You can't even control 
uh, and handle your own people. So now guess what? The governor is going to have to take care of it for you. And if you want to present your case, then you go to Caesarea and do your case. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, Caesarea, by the way, was the kind of like the place of the Roman headquarters. That's why he's sent there. It was on, um, on the Mediterranean Sea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, just so uh, this is the other thing, you know, how I kind of go down rabbit holes and find out. So this is Felix, the governor. And I just kind of did some research because I was like, well, wait a minute. I thought Pontius Pilate was the governor. Um, but uh, remember, this is Pontius Pilate was oh. the governor when, when Jesus was crucified. But this happens probably about 20 years after um, the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, this time frame that we're looking at. So um, now there's a new governor. Pilate was governor until from 27 AD until 37, either 26 or 27 to 36 or 37. Um, so for about 10 years. And then he, he was recalled um, to Rome. And there were a couple of guys in between him, fairly short um, 10 years. And now this Felix is the governor. So it's essentially the same position that Pilate had. Oh, okay. 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 All right. I like how Governor Felix was like, I don't wanna. Yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's how they kind of put it. <laughs> and, and really, yeah, it is kind of how it sounds. And really, you know, he has a point. Um, and even the, the Roman commander, you know, in his letter to Felix, um, cause he says, um, you know, I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. He's like, look, this is a religious problem. I don't even know why we're getting involved in all this, except for the fact that Paul is a Roman citizen. This is, my, this is St. Well, Paul's bacon here. Yeah. Also, my commentary mentioned that Governor Felix asked, asked about which province he was from because there are different governors for different provinces, too. Yeah. So that's right. It kind of took the tone of like, I don't want to. So he's trying to like pass well, it off. Yeah, that's part of it. But he also wants to know, like, so he's asking Paul what province you were from when Paul tells him he's from Cilicia. So so the governor is like, where's your hometown, dude? Like, um, if you're a Roman citizen, what part of the Roman provinces are you from that's what he's asking him oh yeah okay. so yeah because he's again i think trying to kind of determine is paul really a roman citizen but you're right you know because it's it's kind of like i don't want to have to deal with this so if he can prove um that paul is not a roman citizen then he was like sorry dude not my problem figure it out yourselves but he can't. okay okay that's interesting Commentary didn't mention that, but that that makes more sense. Yeah, but you're right. Felix doesn't want to have to deal with this, and and we'll kind of see that Felix kind of tries to pass the buck a little bit in the next chapter. But yeah, kind of like, and then their parents are like, "Do we really need to solve this problem?" <laughs> yeah, you know, you got to figure out is it, um, yeah, is it is it like something? wanting to share crayons like each yeah. one. And then there's two, but the other one wants their that red crayon that they had. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. <laughs> a lot of times I just break them in half and give them. Yeah. To half. <laughs> now you both have the red crayon. <laughs> and like, what was it? Uh, it wasn't uh, who was it? Was it King Solomon with the baby? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. But that makes sense that he has to prove. Um. His, uh, his yeah, he's wanting to wanting to re you know redetermine his his Roman citizenship. Yeah. Why are we even getting involved in this? Well, because then I'm sure there's documentation they can check at that province or whatever to. Maybe. For, yeah, maybe. That, or uh, maybe this chapter, right? Or was it the chapter 21? Uh, where they previous chapter when oh yeah when Paul and that um, guard are having the conversation about um you know the guy says oh i had to buy my citizenship and paul's like nah dude i was born and yeah well and there because there was a note about and you had spoken about like his like family tree and how that was proven and how they checked and yeah. all that yep that would make 
Yeah, I can't remember if it was. No, it was, yeah, it was last week. Yeah. Okay. It's been so long. Yeah, I know. I'm holding. All right. So we, awesome. get, we don't get thunder and lightning here, and it's thunder and lightning outside my window. So oh, cool. if I make, I was making faces, that's why I was really shocked. Yeah. Because that doesn't happen. So. Yeah, didn't watch it. That'll be fun. All right, let's close our time in prayer. Okay. Gracious God, thank you uh, for the gift of this time together and for the gift of your word and the ability to be able to read and study and discuss and learn. We pray that you would be with us now as we go our separate ways and uh, into the week ahead. Lord, help us to be good ambassadors for you. Help us to represent you in everything that we say and do. Uh, be with us now as we take a break next week and uh, keep us sharp in your word until the time when we can come back together. We pray this all in the holy and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us. It was good to have you with us. A reminder that we will not be having a Wednesdays in the word next week, but we'll return the week after that. So have a great week off and I'll look forward to digging more in as we kind of barrel toward the end of the um, book of Acts together. <laughs>